me love being alive. And he's going to do that for you too one day. And that was 10 years ago. And last night, he went to adoration. He got out of work at 10.30, and he went to adoration to pray for me and Virginia, who joined me here today to make sure we would have a wonderful time here with all of you. It's so powerful to love. It's nothing to pray. It's nothing to put your hand out and reach to God. This is Jesus in you reaching out to the Father in love. You and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father. There's nothing that the enemy can do about that unless you open the door. Unless you have your alarm system on. Unless you give in to tendencies and impulses that are against who you really are in Christ Jesus. And that is the learning <coughs> process that you will encounter every day. Every day. So, worry. Philippians 4, 6, and chapter 7, 1, and Peter 5, 7, and John 14, 27. There's a lot to be said about worry. How many of you worry? What do you worry about? I worried how I was going to get into this outfit this morning. <laughs> we worry about the most ridiculous things, don't we? But here it says, God has offered no trade. His peace for your anxiety. God has offered to trade his peace for your anxiety. God has offered to trade his peace for your anxiety. Philippians 4, 6. Can you repeat that? God has offered to trade his peace for your anxiety. When you give in to worry, you're actually saying that God can't do it. Why would you believe that? That's what happens when you worry. When you worry about your kids, you worry about your husband, you worry about your finances, you worry about your health. Doubt, James 1, 5. God provides wisdom for the asking. But if you don't have a relationship with God, then how can you ask? You might think that he would not listen because you don't have a good relationship with him, right? I mean, some people have the tenacity. They can go up to a complete stranger and say, hey, you know, I need 20 bucks. <laughs> right? Yeah. I need 20 bucks. And some people, they'll just go to the next person. I need 20 bucks. I need 20 bucks. And finally, somebody gives them the $20. Right? I've been that person that's given the twenty dollars. My husband's like, "Are you crazy?" I said, "No, oh, he needs it." And he goes, "How do you know he's not going to use it for drugs or whatever?" And I said, "I don't know. You know, that's it's not my business to know that. That's something that I don't even want to know. I just want to know one thing. I just want to know Jesus, and I want to know Jesus crucified. That's what I want to know. I don't want to know about these spirits and how they have hold over me." I don't want to give in to reckless abandon in, in my thought life. I only want to know one thing. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know Jesus crucified. That's what I want to know. So when these thoughts come, worry comes, guilt comes, inadequacy comes, insecurity comes, I'm saying, I don't want to know you. I only want to know Jesus and Jesus crucified, and they're gone. Can you say that with me? I only want to know Jesus and Jesus crucified. That's what Paul said. St. Paul, someone who was so educated, highly educated, came from a, a, a wealthy family, could speak several languages, traveled all over Europe, 
which was known as the world at that time. And he found out the same way that Solomon found out. Solomon asked for wisdom. And he moved away from God's wisdom, and he got so much wisdom from all the other women that he married and the gods that came with them that he felt. And Paul realized, you know, I only want to know one thing. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know Jesus crucified. And that's what we want to do here today. We want to know Jesus, and we want to know him crucified. Did he die on a cross? Was it enough? Yes, it was enough. It's enough to change what you're thinking about today, so that when you leave here tonight, you're going to have a whole new thought process going on in your mind. There's going to be a reprogramming going on in your mind. Okay, um, I have a signal here that I've got uh, time is up, so I'm going to have to put here, you know, I just have to say, like, Father Becker and Father Kim and myself, when we are up here, and I just want to invite you, I want you to be invited when you have an opportunity to give your testimony, to be a witness, that when you stand up here and you feel the empowerment of the Holy Spirit coming through you, that you won't go, woohoo! Because that's how you feel. You don't want to leave this spot. You just want to talk, talk, talk to Jesus and the Holy Spirit for people to hear and understand how much they're loved. Because that's how I feel about you today. I love you with the heart of Jesus. A prayer that is led between you and the Holy Spirit. Now, St. Gertrude um, shared that one day when she was at Holy Mass, she saw one of her sisters coming up to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in a very uh, humble and timid and reverent way. And so she asked the Lord, you know, that's not how she really is. You know, why is, she, why is she coming to receive you that way? You know, I come to receive you in truth, as in the pure form that I am, not in um, that kind of timidity and fear and awe. And he said to her, and of course I'm uh, at living here, I don't have a book with me to share with you. But he shared with her that, you know, some people he allows to come to him with that kind of reverence and that kind of fear of the Lord and that kind of timidity. And others he allows them to come forward in the pure form of joy and love, happy to receive him. He said, that's what's not important. What's important is who's coming to me in faith. This is where we get to practice our faith. So we understand a deeper, intimate prayer time with Jesus. Now he said something very interesting to her. He said, can you imagine that everyone who receives me in faith, at that moment, in heaven and on earth, receives of my Favor. One person. We had Mass today. How many of us came up to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in faith? <laughs> we all did. We all did. Sometimes what happens is we put too much logic in there and we listen to the enemy with their negative thoughts saying that we do not deserve to partake with the Lord Jesus Christ, his body and blood, when we are called to do that very thing. And so in faith we do it. We eat his body and we drink his blood. And every time you do that, imagine the ripple effect that in heaven and on earth at that very same time received the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's tantamount, don't you think? Wouldn't you want to go to Mass more often because of that? You mean all I have to do is go to Mass, receive the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, and everyone in heaven, 
on earth and underneath, he says, also, will receive of his glory, his abundance. That's amazing. I want to go to Mass every day. Just for that very reason. Of course, a lot of us can't because we work, we have family, you know, we have obligations, but then there are Mass times anywhere you go, you can make it if you make the arrangements to do that. This Lent, try to do that. Try to go to Mass as often as you can and imagine that everyone in heaven and earth and who is in purgatory will receive the glory of the Lord. You, 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 you. How many of us have relatives who are purgatory? I don't know. My dad's an orphan. So I really don't, but I go in faith, knowing that they are being released. Amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, going back to the topic of praying inwardly, I'd like to go to 2 Corinthians 4.16, which says, uh, Therefore, we are not discouraged. Rather, although our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So we know that this tent that is over our spiritual being, because we are created in the image of God. We are spirit. Okay? We're spirit first. If, if you didn't have a limb, does that mean you wouldn't be who you are? If karma didn't have a limb, would that mean that I'm not karma? No. I, I didn't have a choice as to who or when I would be born, who my parents would be, the color of my hair, my complexion, when I would be uh, conceived. I had no choice in that. But I do have a choice, a will that God has given me, a godly <coughs> will to decide what I believe in. And if Jesus believes that he is the Savior of the world, I believe it too. If uh, the apostles believe that Jesus was king, then I believe he's my king too. If all the saints of all the thousands of years believe that he is the resurrected Lord, then I believe it too. And if all of you who are shaking your heads right now believe all of that, then we certainly believe in the Holy Spirit too. Because you cannot have the Father and the Son and not have the Holy Spirit. We have a trinity. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At one time, I believed that God was far off and that Jesus Christ did roam the face of the earth, but he's resurrected now and he's in heaven sitting with, with God. And the Holy Spirit is just, you know, the Spirit of God the Father in love and, well, I don't have any association with him, but I do. In baptism, I do. We all do. So we're all connected, as Father Kim said, and as uh, we heard um, earlier this morning from Father Becker, we're all connected. That's what we want to stress the most, is that we are connected. You are connected right next to the person who's next to you. Say, we are connected. We are connected. That's right. We are connected. Okay. Um, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, it says, The Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. How many of you here are in healing ministry? Raise your hands. In healing ministries. Do you know what healing ministry is? Did you know that you were conferred the entitled and indeed the power and strength of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit? That you can pray with other people? Okay, let me rephrase that now. How many of you have prayed with other people? See, that is amazing. What does praying with people bring if it does not bring healing? Spiritual healing. Physical healing, emotional healing. We all are called to the ministry of healing. 
but it also takes an understanding of discernment of what is good and what is evil. Now, I want to share with you a story one time where I was in prayer ministry, and in this prayer ministry was uh, basically for healing at a charismatic conference. And a gentleman came up to me, and I had two other individuals with me. I was leading the prayer. And so I asked the individual, what is it that you're asking of the Lord today? And he said, I need a job. And as soon as I heard his voice, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in me, discerned that there was something that was not correct with this individual. So I backed away. Like this, like I wanted somebody else on the team to pray with that person. But no, the Holy Spirit didn't allow that. The Holy Spirit pushed me forward, just like that. And I understood, okay, this is my assignment. I'm going to pray with this individual. But I also heard the Holy Spirit say, ask him to say the name of Jesus. So I had learned one of the first things that you do is you pray, right? This is a perfect example when you don't know what to do in an area of ministry. You don't know what to do. You've heard a Father Becker and Father Kim say pray. Can you say pray? Pray. But there are certain levels of prayer. One of them is tongues. How many of you pray in tongues? Praise the Lord. Now this is a love language that doesn't make any sense at all. It comes from the heart. It doesn't come from the head. It comes from the heart. It wells up in the heart and it comes out of your vocal cords as you yield over to the Holy Spirit. It's a love language. How many of you ever held a newborn baby or a baby in your arms? And you're caressing the baby like so. And you're doing baby language, aren't you? <laughs> right? Do you know what you're saying? No, it's coming from it's coming from the heart in your spirit. And some babies smile back at you because they just got, you know, fresh from heaven. They probably know the Holy Spirit better than you do. And they go, oh, look, they're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what tongues is. So I immediately went into this love language. I was checking in with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, just pray in tongues and explain to the young man that you're going to pray over him in tongues with the Holy Spirit. So I did that. I explained to him. I said, look, uh, you say that you need a job, but God wants something more for you. And so um, I don't know what that is. Only God knows. But the Holy Spirit is here on the face of the earth to minister to you. So I'm just going to pray with you in tongues. This is a love language uh, between uh my spirit and the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you. Is that all right? And he said, yes. I said, okay. I asked him one more time, can you say the name of Jesus? And he said, no. Right away, there was some judgmentalism coming in, some criticism coming in. Oh, he just wants attention was one of the words I heard. Oh, he's just being rebellious. He's being hard-headed. Those were some of the negative thoughts that were coming in that I needed to discern, that I needed to push away so the Holy Spirit could come and take charge. It's not about what we think. We can't let our logic come into the picture. This is We're an instrument of the Holy Spirit. So I began to pray in tongues over the individual. This man was tall. He's a big man. And I said, okay, can you say the name of Jesus? And he said, no, I can't. So I look at uh, either side to my partners, and they're like, you know, just give it up. But I heard the Holy Spirit say, no, keep going. And I remembered that time that my friend needed to borrow faith from, I needed to borrow his faith. Remember I told you about that? I had to borrow his faith so I could be set free. I think that was one of those moments I said, that's one of those, I'm going to lend some of my faith 
over to him. I said, you know what? I'm going to stay here with you until you can say the name of Jesus, until whatever is holding you back from saying the name of Jesus, you're going to have a breakthrough tonight. I'm going to stay here with you, okay? And he said, okay. I looked into his eyes. I could see the longing that he wanted to be set free. So we prayed in tongues, and my other two partners, they hopped in also. They started praying in tongues. We're praying in tongues, praying in tongues. And then we stopped, and I'm can you say the name of Jesus? He goes, no. And this by this time, he's crying. He wants to be set free. He wants to have a breakthrough. Who am I to deny him that? It's getting late. It's already been 15 minutes. So we start praying in tongues again, and we're praying and praying and praying and praying. I said, can you say the name of Jesus? And he was struggling. He just could not say it. So then I had one of the other people who was with me say, you know, that's a demonic cult. You know, we, we cannot go any further with him. He needs to go and uh, see a priest. This is uh, higher, bigger than what we can do. And I said, you know, I respect that. And I was relieved. You know, it was already, you know, 25 minutes of praying with him. I was relieved. Okay, let's just go ahead and we, we um, refer him to another priest that he can make an appointment with. But the Holy Spirit said, no. This is very, it's very important for you to have good communication with the Holy Spirit to know what is right and when to do it. And at this particular time, I knew I was supposed to stay with that particular person. So I stayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and he was able to say, Jesus. He was able to say, Jesus. He got a breakthrough. On another team, a man came up to me, and he said, I saw what you were doing. I just want you to know that that was my brother-in-law. Oh. That was my brother-in-law. And he's been wanting to be set free for a long time. Can you see? The desire and the love and not being afraid always conquers. Jesus says, do not be afraid. So it's important to know about these three persons, like I mentioned before. So I'm going to give you some reference about it. If you want to write this down, it says right here in 1 Timothy 4.1, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the last time, some will turn away from the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and demonic instruction. Now the natural person is described in Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your transgresses trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the age of this world. This is very important to understand. Do you follow the nature of the world? This age of the world, do you follow it? I'm asking you, do you follow it? Make up your mind today, do you follow it? You should say no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the ruler of the possessors of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the disobedient. Are you disobedient? No, you're not disobedient. You need to understand that you are not disobedient. You are obedient because you believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 14, verses 3-3, describes the natural person. Now, the natural person does not accept what pertains to the Spirit of God. Do you accept what pertains to the Spirit of God? Yes, because what's going to happen tonight is what is going to be conferred over to you are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we have to get this mindset in your mind. It, it's called reprogramming. That's what Paul describes it. The reprogramming of your mind. So that you do not associate yourself with the natural person. So that you do not associate yourself so much with the fleshy person, but that you move forward to the spiritual person. So it says here, um, 
The natural person does not accept what pertains to the Spirit of God, for to him it is foolishness, and he cannot understand it because it is judged spiritually. There is no spirituality in the natural person. Paul distinguishes between three types of people in relating to the life and the spirit, the natural persons, spiritual persons, and fleshly persons. So let's examine the critical differences pertaining to spiritual life which exists between these three kinds of individuals. Now I took the time to uh, gather this information. I don't want to deviate from it because it's important. And I would recommend to you that you write your notes. Okay, Ephesians 2, 1, 3 contains a concise description of the natural person Paul defines in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. This person is spiritually dead. Can you say spiritually dead? Spiritually dead. Separated from God. Separated from God. Living independently from God. Living from God. Does this describe you? No. no. The natural person has a soul in that he can think, feel, and choose. But his mind and subsequently his emotions and his will is directed by his flesh, which acts completely apart from God who created him. The natural person may think he is free to choose his behavior, but since he lives in the flesh, he invariably walks according to the flesh, and his choices reflect the deeds of the flesh listed in Galatians 5, 19, 21. Now, I did a little skit of what I was like after I was baptized, after I um, was converted to Catholicism after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I still had this, a distorted identity, didn't I? I kind of behaved like this natural person, correct? It looked like that, didn't it? Yeah. I was going with my own inclinations, my own impulses, pretty much like I was a ball, a boss. I was commanding and demanding and screaming and shouting. These are things that are not of God. So I'm not going to ask how many of you do that. <laughs> the natural person lives independently of God. His purposes uh, do not reflect the harmony in which he should be living with God and his plan. Paul opens our eyes to the expansive scope of Christ's authority. This is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That's Ephesians 1, verse 21. Now, going back to the young man I was praying with, he could not say Jesus, could he? Was he a natural person? No. See? He was not a natural person. He was a Christian who was under bondage. He was not a natural person. He believed in Jesus Christ. He could not say the name of Jesus because he was under bondage. I'm going to share with you later tonight the different kinds of bondage that there are. So can you see the difference now? You see the difference? There's two examples. You saw the way that I was? Was I a natural person? No, but I acted kind of like one, didn't I? And then the man that I prayed over, he looked like he was a natural person too, but he was not. He was caught up in bondage, and so was I. It's very easy to get caught up in bondage. So now let's talk about the fleshly person. The fleshly person is described in 1 Corinthians 2, I mean 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, I give you milk to drink. I give you milk to drink. Why do you think he is giving us milk and not food? Because we're babes. Did you see a toddler in me before? Yes. And did you see a poor babe? Stuck in turmoil? Yes. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. So here God is telling us, 
how we sometimes act like the natural person, and that's called fleshly. Okay? The spirit of the fleshly person is identical to that of the spiritual person. What? There's another person? There's a spiritual person too. There's a natural person, fleshly person, spiritual person. I don't know. Where, which person am I? Right? That's where Satan wants you. He wants you so confounded. You don't know which person you are. But one thing for sure is we're supposed to believe in the three persons of the Trinity. Amen. Okay, so the spirit of the fleshy person is identical to that of the spiritual person. The fleshly person is a Christian, spiritually alive in Christ, and declared righteous by God. But that's where the similarity ends. Instead of being directed by the spirit, this believer chooses to follow his own impulses. <coughs> I shared with you about my impulses and how I was living below my potential. I shared with you about the young man, and I'm sure you have your own battles that you've had to contend with. But I want to describe now the spiritual person to you, and I think I did that earlier uh, this morning. Uh, this comes from Galatians 5, 23, the spiritual person. Now, the spiritual person, this is very interesting. Because this describes the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The spiritual person lives by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. God created us to have an inward alarm system. How many of you have an alarm system in your car? <coughs> Why? <laughs> Why? In case someone tries to break in. How about in your home? Some people have alarm systems in their home too because they don't want anyone to break in. But is it okay for someone to break into our spiritual house? But sometimes we do let that happen. <coughs> we let the enemy of ours come in, bound us up, and just take from us. That's why it's important to have this gift of tongues and also the gift of discernment. To understand, tongues is so powerful. As soon as the enemy hears you speaking in tongues, they know that you are shutting down the doors. You are locking the windows. You are securing the perimeter. In the name of Jesus. And so they start to shake and they quake. And depending on what you do next, makes the decision for them to leave. And that's when you stand up and you say no. In the name of Jesus, no. Now, the spiritual person uses the fruits of the Holy Spirit of love and joy and peace and happiness and kindness and generosity, gentleness, and the last one, self-control. Now, the first are very easy, we think. Love. Is that an easy fruit to bear? Love? It's a difficult one. It's a difficult fruit to bear. But it's easy with the innocent. We can love a baby. We can even love a puppy. Right? Because they're innocent. We know they're not going to hurt us. So it's easy to love them. But Christ says he wants us to love one another as he loves us. So love is a challenge. And then there's joy. Paul tells us to count all our challenges joy. All of our challenges. So if you're losing your house, if you're in a relationship and your spouse wants a divorce, or maybe you, know, you have a physical disability, Maybe someone at home is being abusive. You're supposed to count that joy. It's difficult, isn't it? But see, the joy is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord, knowing that you are in partnership with Jesus Christ, will help you go through that challenge 
And you will have joy because you know that he is with you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what the word of God says. So we have joy. Then, of course, if we have love, we have joy, then we will be in his peace. What does that mean? What is the peace of the Lord? That's knowing that he has done it. With his last breath, he said it is accomplished. It has been done. We're not talking about feel good. This is not about a feeling good life. This is about a knowing. This is about knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and being able to face all your challenges without being afraid. Conquering your fears. Knowing that Jesus Christ has already done that. Knowing that your flesh is going to break down. Your organs are going to disintegrate. But your spirit is not. You're just beginning. You're just starting. Don't let your body prevent you from increasing in your spiritual body. Remember I shared with you about Gloria? <laughs> I said to her, I, I have a disability. You know, I'm sick. I can't go. And she said, well, what makes you think that I want to go? But we should go. We must go. We have to go. This is where we will learn more how to face our challenges in a godly way. So, now we have uh, patience. We learn patience through that. Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness. And then the last one is self-control. Woo-hoo, self-control. We heard Father Kim talk about driving. You heard me before that talk about driving. There's something about driving that just doesn't bring the, the best out of you, right? And it's so embarrassing. I remember I was at a light. I had just passed up this car. We were going at it back and forth, back and forth. And I was at the light. I put my window down, and the other person put their window down. And there was a brother of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we looked at each other. We laughed. <laughs> we're such children, right? We are such children. But I want to tell you about that alarm system. That alarm system are your emotions. They're your emotions. So if you feel that the enemy is coming into your, what did I call this? Your spiritual house. Trying to break into your spiritual house. You have an alarm system. And it goes off. Wah, 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 wah. If it's anything that opposes love, that's the alarm going off. So if there's hate, or anger, or bitterness, or jealousy, or envy, <coughs> what are some other ones? Fear. Fear. What else? Greed. Greed. Doubt. Insecurity. Envy. Idolatry. Sorcery. Sorcery. Depression, insomnia, jealousy, unloving, rage. Come on, there's more, right? They swarm all around us. Untruth, infidelity, pride, deceitfulness. They're all around, just hovering. No, 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 no. Just waiting, just waiting. Come on, Carmen. Come on, Carmen. Get upset. Get upset at Lee. Look what he did. Look, look. He didn't take the trash out again. Oh, Carmen's gonna get upset now. So they've been watching, and they've been watching. But you know, we have a guardian angel. Amen. Amen. And we have other angels. And they're going, oh, Carmen, don't give in to that. Oh, my gosh, that's such an old one. <laughs> so we listen. We listen in this inner man that we have, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that activates and generates. And we listen. 
And then we are led by the Holy Spirit how to respond to our impulses. Believe me, you're going to get impulses all the time. If the doctor says you shouldn't eat chocolate, and there's a chocolate donut there, and you're hungry, what do you think your impulse is going to be? Eat the donut, right? But there you're losing self-control, right? And you have that in your ear going, you know that's not going to be good for you, you're going to get indigestion, you're going to float, you're going to get constipation. I mean, come on, this is real stuff, right? You hear those things, and then you make a decision. You get to make a decision. You know, what do I really want to do? To some people, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what I don't know is? It's a spirit. It's a spirit of never. N-E-V-E-R. You will never do anything about it. That's one of the, the biggest arguments my husband and I have. You know, boom, 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 leave Carmen, going to fight, they're going to have an argument, because Carmen doesn't know, she wants to go eat, and he doesn't want to tell her, because she'll say no. Doesn't that happen? So where do you want to go eat, honey? I don't know. Well, you want to go eat at, uh, you know, Bill Miller's? No, we ate at Bill Miller's, again. what's the matter with you? Okay, well, uh, you want to go eat at uh, Taco Cabin? No, I don't want to eat at Taco Well, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. <laughs> it's just back and forth. I don't know. I don't know. And who's winning? The enemy's winning. The enemy's gaining ground. So we have to stop. You can stop anytime you want to. You can stop anytime you want to. And you can look at whoever it is that you're with. You know, I'm so sorry. Gosh, I was getting into that spirit of never, and we were going nowhere. Let's make a decision together. So what is, I don't know? It's a spirit of never. What is, I don't know? What is, I don't know? Now tell the person next to you, the spirit of never is, I don't know. Now, when you leave here and you go home and you hear yourself go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to laugh at yourself, right? Yeah. I don't know. And it's so funny. There are different, uh, there are different phases. I actually went in front of the mirror to look at myself say, I don't know. And I was surprised how many I had. I don't know. I don't know. There's so many expressions. These are emotions. But can you see there's no love, joy, peace, happiness, kindness, generosity, gentleness, or self-control there. We have an alarm system. It's our emotions. Do you understand how that works? So when you get angry, where are you? Where's the love? Have you heard that expression? Where's the love? Where's the joy? Where's the peace? So now you know. That's another area in which the, the enemy, Satan, wants to have control over your life is through your emotions, that you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit to keep you in check, to keep you aligned with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So what is never? <laughs> right. Amen. Okay, so we're going to move on now and uh, get to something else here. We've gone through the fleshy person. We've gone to... Uh, go through the spiritual person. What did I say? Fleshy person, natural person, and the spiritual person, right? And we understand that the fleshy person and the spiritual person are, are very closely connected because they both believe, whereas the natural person does not believe. But they, that natural person is very closely related to the fleshy person because they can behave in the same way, even though they both they don't believe. One doesn't believe and one does believe. Is that right? Right. Okay, so I don't want to get confused. <laughs> okay, so we want to talk about living uh, below your potential in Galatians 5 17. 5 17. It talks about the flesh. The flesh sets his desire against the spirit. Now, here the scripture is talking about like the flesh is a whole different person, right? 
The flesh sets itself, its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So we know that St. Paul, and I know I'm just kind of out living here, but St. Paul says something like, why do I do the things that I don't want to do, and why can't I do the things I want to do? You know, it's this tug of war thing. Tug of war, it's going on and on and on and on. You know, okay, you could get a shorter waist doing that exercise, <laughs> but it's not recommended for your spiritual advancement. So it's not a tug of war. This is not a tug of war. We don't know the chain of command. And there is a chain of command. In Jesus Christ, there's Jesus here, and then who's underneath Jesus? Who's underneath? See, that's what I'm saying. Okay, the chain of command is this. Jesus has said that we are his co-heirs. So Jesus is over us. He's the head, right, of the body of the church. What's under the head? The body. So that would be us. us. And then since Satan has been overthrown, who's underneath the church? Satan. So who's underneath us? Satan. Right. So we have Jesus. Then we have us, and then there is Satan. So it's not this way. It's not a tug of war between God, us, and Satan. You know, it's not. You'll just go crazy that way, right? And we have plenty of crazy people who don't know who they are, that walk rambling, talking to themselves, because nobody believes what they see, what they hear. And these things that they see and they hear are real, but they just don't know how to deal with them because they haven't been taught. But you're being taught. This is something that you need to hold on to. It's a safeguard. It's a life jacket. There is a chain of command. And Satan doesn't have command over you. There's a head over the body, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the one that has control over you. He purchased you with his life. He motivates you through the Holy Spirit. And God is in control. That's why Jesus intercedes for us. That's why we have the Holy Spirit, who is the other advocate. That's why we have the Blessed Mother, who also intercedes for us. I love the Blessed Mother. I mean, there are times when I have to go to Mom. You just have to go to mom. And you just want her to hide you under her mantle. And so, so Jesus isn't, um, you know, upset at the way that you behave. Because there are times we do things that are very upsetting to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been told over and over, we have this sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess cycle. Ask the priests. It's a sin, confess, sin, lust, lust, lust. Envy, 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 envy. Lie, 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 lie. How do you get off that circle? It's a, it's bondage is what it is. And it's because we do not read the Bible enough. We do not receive the sacraments enough. Jesus died on the cross for us to receive all of him. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let me ask you about living below your potential. These are questions, okay? And no, there's no right answer or wrong answer, okay? It's just us. We're just here today. We're here to learn. I'm learning with you. I'm hearing things the Holy Spirit is drawing out of me to share with you. I have prepared three different talks, and each talk has so many pages. There's like 22 in one talk, and 30 in another, and 20 in another, and so far in the first two talks, I've only used one page in one and two pages in the other. <laughs> you understand? We load up. We prepare. But it's the Holy Spirit that's going to draw out of us. So I'm learning here with you today. I learn every day. 
So, let me ask you these questions. These are really good. Are you stymied in your growth because of feelings of inferiority? You can answer yes or no in your mind if you want to. Are you stymied in your growth because of feelings of inferiority? Here's the answer. It comes from Ephesians 2, 6. To whom or what are you inferior? You are a child of God, seated with Christ in the heavens. There's your answer. If you are feeling stumped in your spiritual growth, that's because there is a lie do, 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 hovering over you. A block, a spiritual block. And Ephesians 2, 6 is giving you the answer to that problem. Do you feel insecure? Hebrews 13, 5. Your God will never leave you nor forsake you. Why should we feel insecure? In the first part of my, I've been married for 35 years uh, with my second husband, my first, oh my gosh, what a disaster that was. Oh, have you all seen Bridezilla? <laughs> I was a bridezilla wife. Okay? I, I didn't know. I didn't know you were supposed to share. You know, with your I just wanted to be married. I wanted to be married. I wanted to have a husband. I wanted to have a house. I wanted to have children. I didn't know that he was supposed to be in the equation. <laughs> I thought he was just supposed to fit in my life. You go make the money, I keep the house clean, I make the food, I have the kids. Right? I didn't know there was anything else involved in that. That was a disaster. Seven years of a disaster. But see, I had an issue with insecurity, didn't I? I had to have control. Whenever you have the, the spirit of control coming over you, that is insecurity. And here's the answer, Hebrew 13.5. If you have an issue of control, it's because you are being pulled away from the truth that God will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's not because of anything that you did. It's because of what Jesus has already done on the cross. He's not going to take away anything that Jesus died on the cross. That was very difficult, what he had to undertake. He's not going to take anything away from Jesus. And Jesus did it for us. Do, does that make sense? Guilty. How many times do we associate with that ugly spirit of guilt? What was that? When you hurt your family. When you say things that are critical, demeaning. Right? Someone gives you a hard time at work, they dump on you, and you dump on your family members. What's that movie with John Travolta? He tells his mother while they're eating dinner. You dump and they dump and you dump and then you dump on me. Dump, 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 dump. Right? We, it just hops around from one person to another in the family. And then we feel guilty about it. Romans 8, 1. Here's the answer to feeling guilty. You don't have to be guilty. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We are convicted when we do something wrong. And then we know how to get right again. Is there a big sin or a little sin? No. Sin is sin. It's turning away from God. It would be like me talking to you like this. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to this wall. I turn my back to you. That's what we do when we sin. We turn our back to God. That is a sin. When we turn away from whatever, what is sin? What is sin? Turning away from God, that is sin. Turning away from God, that is sin. You are left in the dark. When you don't invite him into your day, you can expect that you will be accompanied by some spirit that is waiting for you to fall and go, 
Ha ha! Got you. Does that make sense? Okay, good, because y'all are being very quiet. It's either it's making sense or it's not making sense, or you know, maybe it's just me. Am I the only one that sins? Maybe I'm all the one that sins. Now, I know I'm not, but I know I do sin. There are plenty of times that I've turned my back on God. One time when I was in, uh, I had deliverance ministry, and I was supposed to uh, pray uh, with my prayer partner uh, with this woman. And it was my husband's day off. And, you know, I was prepared. I prayed. Um, got, did everything I was supposed to do before I went into deliverance ministry. And my husband says, don't worry, I'll just sleep in the car. You know, when you're done, you're done. But sometimes deliverance ministry can take anywhere between 30 minutes to six hours. Well, that would mean my husband would miss all of his day off, right? And I'm like, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let's make this a quick one, right? <laughs> right, because God, you can do anything. So we're, you're just going to do this one in, in a hurry because you know I love my husband want to spend time with my husband. I should have made this appointment anyway because I knew my husband was off. But I did because I had a desire and I had a love. So I get there and we start, you know, doing an overall parameter prayer, you know, to do that. And then we started. Well, we were done. I was able to enjoy my evening with my husband. And then that evening, when, while we're sleeping, I get this nudge, strong nudge, like that. And I'm going, looking at my husband like, what? Are you okay? And he goes, I didn't do anything. Has that ever happened to anybody around here? Oh yeah, see, I see some heads, yeah. Okay, so I'm like, what in the world? No, no, no. I got out my blessed salt and my, my holy water, and I laid in bed and I just kept pondering and pondering and pondering. And here comes the spirit of guilt. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and so I'm saying, okay, now I'm sensing guilt is in the air. So, Holy Spirit, help me to discern what is this exactly that's happening? Why should I have this? You know, spirit of guilt coming around, disturbing my peace. And he took me back, frame by frame by frame by frame of my day. Never criticizing, never telling me you did anything wrong. Just showing me frame by frame by frame by frame my day. And we got to the part where I got into the office. And I remembered, I did not have a personal prayer with the Lord before I entered. Didn't invite him. 